until a few short years ago, men like this daily gambled their lives against the stake of a very small weekly wage. As they checked in at the start of a work day, the gnawing doubt of fear nibbled away at the edge of their consciousness. The miner knew as he descended in the shaft elevator that there was a very good chance that this might be his final trip down. And he had good reason for this fear. In those early days, the miner was sent down into the bowels of the earth with almost no thought of his personal safety. And with each swing of his pick or shovel, he created a danger zone that could snuff out his life as easily as a puff of breath extinguishes a candle flame. Without proper ventilation, he faced the horror of gas poisoning or plain suffocation. It was common practice to carry several canaries down into the mine as a test for gas or lack of air. If the canary died, the miners were supposed to take its death as a warning that something was wrong with the air supply. Quite often, the miners found themselves working deep in tunnels that completely honeycombed the earth underneath the town or city. When this happened, the dangers of a cave-in became a real threat that all too often materialized into the horror of being buried alive. Underground fires often raged out of control, as in the famous Anaconda copper mine, caused by a carelessly discarded candle from a miner's cap light, or a cigarette, or a match. The fire would burn in the very levels just beneath the miner's feet. And finally, the one dread possibility that was always present in the dank air, loaded with dust and volatile gases, mining town, that sound meant only one thing, tragedy. When the whistle blew, it took precedence over anything else that might be going on. All the energy of the community was immediately channeled into one common cause, to save the lives of the men trapped in the mine disaster. And then came the agonizingly slow race to get back down to the trapped victims. And another frightening possibility, sinking a new shaft for the would-be rescuers to reach their entombed buddies would often cause additional cave-ins, but it was a gamble that had to be taken. And all too often, the grim finale of the drama played out in a final scene like this. In 1920, John L. Lewis, only a few years out of the mines himself, became president of the United Mine Workers Union. A series of bitter strikes ripped the industry. And in a closed down company town, the miner found himself sinking lower into the poverty he had known all his life. But the bargaining table brought compromises, more safety precautions, better pay, improved working conditions. But unfortunately, as we shall see, Danger still lurks in the modern-day mine shafts. This point was brought home sharply to the public in the tragic Centralia, Illinois mine explosion of 1947. It proved to be the most deadly mine disaster in America since 1924. Rescue workers, armed with 45-pound oxygen tanks, worked themselves to exhaustion, trying to get the trapped miners. The futility of their efforts soon became clear to the families of the trapped men. Finally, swathed in blankets, the bodies of the dead were brought to the surface. 111 miners in all died in that tragic disaster. A grim reminder that modern day mining is still a danger zone. Now, the danger zone of a flood. And to those of you who have never faced the raging torrent of savage flood waters like this, I can only say, you don't know how lucky you really are. In certain areas, floods are an annual tragedy, as certain as death and taxes. The only questions are, when and how bad is it going to be this time? There's no compromising with a wall of water traveling along at such speed. To anyone in its path, it means just one thing, 
pack what you can and get out. When an otherwise peaceful river goes out of control, it unleashes a destructive power capable of wiping out whole cities. Sometimes there's no warning. A sudden cloudburst can create a river where none had existed, and heaven help anyone or anything in its way. More often, however, we have some warning. A steady protracted rainfall will swell rivers to overflowing. Or a beautiful winter wonderland like this can suddenly become a terrifying threat to life and property. As spring thaws start the solid waters to flowing once again, the melting ice and snow bring the water level rapidly to a point where it has to overflow its bed. And then comes disaster. Even with warning, a major flood inevitably takes its toll of lives, not to mention the millions of dollars worth of property damage left in its wake. For the aged and for the very young, the danger is all too apparent. Somebody has to come to their rescue. And if you've never stepped off your front porch into a rowboat, you've got a new sensation coming. It's awfully hard to leave your home to the mercy of millions of gallons of water like this. But unfortunately, you don't have much choice. Of course, every flood finds victims who decide to stay behind, trusting to luck they'll be safe a while longer, only to find out too late that their last chance of rescue has passed. Man does make an effort to stem the tide. He builds levees and piles sandbags, but he can only build those barriers so high. And once the waters surge forward, man's attempt to halt the flow are pretty futile. Then absolutely nothing can be done but move to higher land and wait for the waters to recede. All living things in the flood area are affected. Human beings must take priority. So all too often, bewildered household pets must be left behind. It's impossible to explain to this shivering dog why he was left stranded on a rooftop floating down the river. The catastrophe of a flood involves more than just the menace of the rampaging waters. Frequently, the threat of epidemic faces the homeless refugees. Mass inoculations are called for and must be executed in a hurry. And thousands of stranded people must be housed, fed, and clothed. When floodwaters swamp a large area, this task is a gigantic one. The destructive force of rushing headwaters is sometimes unbelievable. It can drown whole cities. It can upset huge tanks. It can collapse houses can twist steel railroad tracks. And always it takes human lives. And then, when the waters finally return to their normal state, the people go back to a city of mud and filth. This is the trademark of a flood. And it's always the same. Thick, black, and foul-smelling. In some parts of the world, a roaring, raging flood like that has been known to mean the death of hundreds of thousands of people. In China, a flood in 1887 claimed 900,000 unfortunate souls before it had run its course. Again, in 1911, 100,000 more perished. Here in America, the Mississippi and Ohio rivers annually leap their banks and spread unchecked to cause untold millions in damage. When you're caught in a quake, it's fine if you're brave, but it's best if you're lucky. You can't see an earthquake, but you can see the destruction it leaves behind. Here a quake cracked open a mountain range, hurled a town off a thousand foot cliff, left 6,000 dead. This happened to be Ecuador in 1949. But earthquakes strike anywhere, anytime, without warning. It could just as easily have happened to you or me. Here is Tokyo in 1923, a giant tinder box of rice paper and wood, colorful, busy, alive. But shortly after these scenes were recorded, an earthquake virtually wiped out Japan's capital city. 
143,000 persons died. 400,000 buildings were destroyed. In this century, Japan has been the victim of countless giant earth tremors. One of the worst in recent years hit the city of Fukui in 1948. The whole city was destroyed in one half minute. Concrete bridges torn asunder. A hint of the force of the upheaval could be seen in these cracks ripped in the ground. The city's largest department store remained standing. Barely. A caricature of a building. More than 3,000 persons were killed in this disaster. There have been worse quakes. One in China in the 16th century wiped out 830,000 people. But nothing could have been worse than this to a mother carrying her dead child. In the United States, it's the West Coast that takes the biggest beating. These are on-the-spot pictures of the famous Long Beach earthquake of 1933. The ground was still shaking when these scenes were shot. As Long Beach and Los Angeles began to dig out of the wreckage, the death toll mounted. The final count showed more than 120 dead, almost 1,000 injured, and damage in the millions. Seven years later, Southern California's Imperial Valley was a victim. Even the roads were bent and twisted like strips of taffy. In 1952, almost the entire state of California was jolted out of bed at 4.30 in the morning by a violent tremor. Bakersfield bore the brunt of it, as you can see. But the earthquake California will never forget was the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. These actual scenes tell the horror of the quake. San Francisco's surviving citizens walked among the ruins in disbelief. They had to watch where they stepped. Many of the streets had become man traps of sinking cobblestone and slipping soil. Those buildings the earthquake left standing were gutted by the great fire it started. Not until World War II was a steel and concrete city to look like this again. The West Coast's first great metropolis, reduced to a shell and 452 persons dead in the tragedy. When the earth trembles, it may crack open even the most solid ground. That gaping crevice you're looking at used to be an Idaho farm. Earth movement turned it into a chasm 300 feet deep within a matter of weeks. Slightly east of here, on the night of August 17, 1959, in western Montana near the Madison River, an earthquake dislodged a mountainside, sending it plunging towards hundreds of vacationers sleeping in camps and trailers. A dark reminder of the terrible forces within the earth waiting to be unleashed. This was Texas City. To the 15,000 inhabitants, it was known fondly as the port of opportunity to the world. It became known as the port of death. This was a disaster unequaled in the history of the United States. This was the explosive, fiery death that claimed the lives of 561 persons. A French freighter loaded with nitrate fertilizer blew itself to bits when a fire broke out on board. In doing so, it touched off one of the most fantastic series of fires and explosions ever recorded. The docks were one mass of flame and smoke as far as the eye could see. Nothing went untouched. The big $20 million Monsanto chemical plant caught fire and ripped apart in a series of gigantic explosions that were felt for 150 miles away. Dead bodies were hurled through the air for hundreds of feet. Twisted metal fell from the sky like flaming meteors. Houses in the town were pancaked, one after another. The concussion smashed everything in its path. Then the oil storage tanks ignited, greasy black smoke mushroomed upward, an advance guard for the fiercely hot flames. After the first stunning blow of the explosions, the town did its best to fight back. The fire trucks came clanging to the scene. In the harbor, a fireboat swung into position and began pouring thousands of gallons of water onto the blaze that was devouring the entire dock front. As soon as possible, rescue crews fought their way into the inferno. It was hard to imagine that lump of chart remains as ever being a human being. The 
dead were carried to an improvised morgue in the high school gymnasium. As soon as a body was identified, his name was hastily scrawled on a blackboard, and the death roster grew longer by the minute. Destruction was everywhere you looked. To the residents of that disaster-ridden town, the whole world seemed to be on fire. To the wives and loved ones of the victims, the world had temporarily come to an end. Their loss could never be measured in terms of dollars and cents. And then there were the injured to take care of. 3,000 or more of them. The shock and horror of what they had been through lined their faces. It was something they never would forget. Everywhere was the evidence of the unbelievable force of the explosion. Steel railroad tracks twisted like cardboard. Plaster stripped off a building, exposing the bricks underneath. The final score, over $50 million in property damage, 561 dead, over 3,000 injured. Memorial services for the dead were conducted in an open field where still burning buildings served as a backdrop for the proceedings. And in the town, a jeweler's clock gave out a constant grim reminder that the disaster had begun at exactly 9.19. This was Texas City in April of 1947. As businessman Marcel Luban performed the final adjustments on his clothing and equipment, the only thing on his mind was the possible bettering of the record of for a vertical descent of 1,168 feet. Luban himself had set the record earlier and was now out to break it. After four days of exploring the Pierre Saint Martin cave, in the French Pyrenees, he sent up the signal that he was ready to return to the world above ground. On the way up, the steel hoisting cable, rubbing against jagged rocks, weakened and broke. Luban fell 120 feet, fracturing his spine and lapsing into unconsciousness. A Dr. Mary with the expedition of 13 men quickly descended to the injured man but even as he lashed him to a stretcher, preparatory to bringing him to the surface, Luban died. Mary returned to the top, bearing the tragic news. The ancient artist belonging had claimed another victim. A year later, another expedition carried off a successful exploration of the cave. They paused thoughtfully at Luban's grave at the level of 1,000 feet down it was a sad reminder that even the most experienced cave explorer constantly faces the threat of death in his hazardous occupation. The spelunker frequently finds himself just on the brink of disaster. He has often been likened to a mountain climber in reverse. Whether he is hanging hundreds of feet in the air or scrambling up rocky ledges, his very life often depends on his agility and his knowledge of the ways of nature. The rewards are many. Underground formations are breathtaking in their exquisite beauty. Sometimes, though, these same shimmering stalactites and stalagmites create formidable barriers for the underground explorer. More often than not, the spelunker needs to be a scuba diver in order to keep his expedition going. Underground rivers and streams quite frequently bar his entrance to additional unexplored caverns and caves. The science of spelunking above all demands the highest versatility from the man or woman who desires to practice it. True, it can transport them into another world of awesome splendor. But as we have seen and are about to see further, it can also be a ticket into a deadly danger zone. In February of 1925, a young Kentuckian named Floyd Collins made headlines in every newspaper across the country by getting himself trapped in an underground cave in his native bluegrass state. Collins had been exploring some caverns in the vicinity of Mammoth Cave when a rockfall pinned his foot under a huge boulder. His plight caught the nation's attention and set off a rescue operation that reeked with carnival spirit. 
everyone got into the act as Collins' family stood a day and night vigil by the cave. Press photographers had up field day. There seemed to be more people having their pictures taken than there were people trying to dig out the trapped victim. Finally, at the end of 18 days, came the word that Collins was dead. They had not been able to reach him in time. May 6, 1937. German passenger dirigible to Hindenburg, the airship on its way to its mooring at Lakehurst, New Jersey, after completing his first transatlantic crossing of the season. People gathered on the ground to welcome the Hindenburg sense that something out of the ordinary is happening. The airship keeps filling its water ballast, and yet it isn't settling to its mooring mass as it should. The Hindenburg dumps still more ballast. Incredible happens. No one who was there can ever forget it. The screams of the trapped passengers, the smell of burning flesh, fire so intense the giant dirigible crumpled like a handful of cellophane. the British dirigible, the R-34, sailing over New York in 1919. She had just completed the first transatlantic dirigible crossing. Dirigibles were still so new, one of the R-34 officers had to parachute down to supervise the moorings. A perfect landing all the way around. These big gas bags were lovely to look at. Giant balloons stretched over rigid frames. But the hydrogen gas that kept them inflated was dangerously inflammable. A short circuit sparked this fire, and the U.S. Navy dirigible B-6, along with its hangar, went up in smoke. Luckily, there was no one in the hangar when it exploded. The accident didn't slow down the airship enthusiasts. That same year, 1921, America tested a brand new dirigible, Roma, built in Italy at a cost of $400,000. The 400-foot ship boasted a box-type rudder designed to make quick, sharp-angle turns. But only a few months later, the pride of our dirigible fleet burst into flames near Hampton, Virginia. It had crashed into electric wires. Its huge box rudder had caught on the poles, and 34 men had died. Three years later, the dirigible Shenandoah the first helium-inflated airship was shredded to bits in a storm over Ohio. Wreckage was strewn over a 10-square-mile area. But thanks to the non-inflammable helium gas, she hadn't burned. So 29 of the 43 men aboard were lucky survivors. Other countries were having their airship tragedies, too. This is the French Demoud. Her entire 50-man crew perished when she dropped into the Mediterranean in 1923. 46 men died when the British passenger dirigible, the R-101, crashed here in France in 1930. But the Germans did not lose faith. When the Graf Zeppelin made its first flight to the United States in 1929, the waning interest in airships got a shot in the arm. It had been a delightful two-day trip. The passengers thoroughly enjoyed every minute. Its commander, Dr. Hugo Eckner, was delighted. After its record-breaking round-the-world flight was completed, the Graf Zeppelin settled down for regular transatlantic runs. She soon became a familiar East Coast sight drifting across the sky. Bolstered by the German success, the United States commissioned two new Navy dirigibles. First in the service was the Akron, based at Lakehurst, New Jersey. She was a beauty, 785 feet long, 133 feet in diameter. But in April 1933, while cruising over the Atlantic, the Akron crashed into the sea during a storm. It was the worst airship disaster in history, one that cost the lives of 73 men aboard the Akron. And that wasn't all. The Navy airship, the J-3, on its way to the scene of the Akron crash, met the same fate, a watery grave. Only a few weeks before, the Akron sister ship, the Macon, had been christened. Her performance during the next two years seemed to justify the Navy's faith in her. 
This was one of her achievements, retrieving an airplane in flight. Once the plane had hooked on, it was raised into the belly of the Macon, where an interior hangar could house five such planes. Then in February 1935, the Macon embarked on maneuvers with the Pacific Fleet. Despite several damaged girders in her port fin, everything went smoothly until she was almost home. Off point, sir, the Macon began to fall apart. When the ships of the Pacific Fleet seemed to the rescue, all that remained of the Macon were shreds of the giant envelope bobbing on the ocean. Of the crew of 82, only two went down with the airship. All the others managed to stay alive in the ocean till help arrived. Operator, operator, this is an emergency call. I want the Elmville Weather Bureau, main 2100. This is Brummett, Mr. Powell. Tornado about a mile east of the Winton pumping station. Moving fast your way, northeast. Yes, the bottom is touching the ground. Yes, that day, Elmville was struck by a tornado. Most violent type of storm on Earth. Normally, we can expect about 180 tornadoes each year in the United States. They can occur anywhere in the nation. However, the greatest number occur in the flat land areas east of the Rocky Mountains. Each individual tornado is a violent local vortex in the atmosphere. The tornado's parent is a thundercloud and the vortex suddenly descends to rotate wildly along the Earth in an upward spiraling motion. The funnel consists of air and moisture to which dust, mud, and debris are added by the inrushing winds, estimated to be rotating at speeds as high as 500 miles an hour. Tornadoes are usually funnel-shaped, although they may take the form of a rope, an elephant trunk, or a column. Although its sweep is generally only about 400 yards wide and up to 16 miles long, a tornado's destructive power is appalling. Strong buildings are reduced to rubble. Automobiles lifted and flung through the air. Great trees whirled about like toothpicks. The creation of a partial vacuum within the vortex can cause buildings literally to explode when the funnel passes close to them. No one knows all the facts about tornadoes, but meteorologists can detect the thunderstorm conditions that give birth to them. The presence of layers of air of contrasting temperature, moisture, density, and wind flow. Such combinations of conditions may generate a tornado. Usually this does not happen, but when the clouds become unusually threatening, it is wise to take every possible precaution. That calls for forewarning. And it is the responsibility of the United States Weather Bureau to provide the public with information regarding the possibility of severe local storms, including tornadoes. Such advance notice can save many lives and even help reduce property damage. A severe weather forecast was issued for the Elmville area. All public outlets were advised, police, radio and television stations, and news networks, and the Elmville Observer Network was alerted. This was not a tornado warning. Its purpose was merely to alert the public to the possibility of a tornado occurring somewhere in the Elmville area. to bring you this severe weather forecast issued by the United States Weather Bureau at Elmville. There are indications that locally severe thunderstorms will southward back to the west border of Wallaby. Within this area and perhaps... The public in reacted areas, calmly. They had learned from the network's information program that this alert meant only that storm conditions existed, that no tornado had yet developed. They knew that experienced observers were at their stations watching that if and when a tornado developed, they would be warned. So they went about their business as usual, except that practically every radio and TV set in the area was turned on. Mid-afternoon, towering thunderheads had appeared. 
with a sickly greenish-black color. On Jesse Brummett's farm, a heavy rain was falling, and he came indoors to watch from his kitchen. Then, at 3.26, This is Brummett, Mr. Powell. Tornado about a mile east of Wind Pumping Station. A mile east of Wind Pumping Station. Looks like a bad one. Okay, we'll take it from there. This was it. Brummett's call gave Elmville nearly 30 minutes to get ready. Powell and his assistants issued an immediate tornado warning to all communities in the path of the storm. the warning please the exact location of the tornado was flashed to the nearest radar station which began to track it what they saw were echoes from a number of storms over a radius of many miles but most important the peculiar s-shaped echo of the tornado cloud Brummett had spotted now they could follow its path and report any change of speed or direction Meanwhile, warned by television, radio, and telephone, the public followed tornado safety rules. Those with storm cellars had the best protection. People in open country sought ditches or ravines. Lying flat in a depression will guard against one of the greatest hazards, flying debris as deadly as shrapnel. In homes, doors and windows on the north and east sides were opened to help reduce damage to the buildings. Families took shelter in the southwest corner of their homes, in basements if they had them. In apartments, office buildings, and factories, people moved to prearranged positions against inside walls on the lower floors. And in schools, because of practice drills, the pupils went to their assigned places on the lower floors, away from windows and large roof areas. Within minutes, the people of Elmville had taken shelter. There was no panic, for this was an informed community. Five minutes later, the tornado roared into the city. it was gone. As suddenly as it came, the wind shifted and the air cleared over a scene of devastation. Property damage totaled millions of dollars, but no lives were lost and there were few injuries. Without the Weather Bureau warning, without the local storm warning network, without the calm cooperation of an informed public, the toll might have been tragically high. Nothing can prevent a tornado or any other storm. But the United States Weather Bureau is predicting their approach with ever-increasing accuracy. A large part of the tornado safety program is in the hands of the public. Every community in an area subject to these storms should have an active local warning network. If you live in such an area, support your local network. If you don't have one, start one. The nearest Weather Bureau office will furnish detailed information and assistance. Such self-reliance may save the lives of your family, your friends, and your neighbors if you are ever in the path of a tornado. <laughs>